let me uh, let me ask you this: What power do you know that is stronger than all the nuclear bombs in this world combined? Matter of fact, it's even a power that is stronger than the forces that brought creation into existence. Uh, what was that? I think you, you said something. Jesus Christ. That is correct. And, and, and what in particular of his power? Yes. Love. His love, very true. Mercy. Yes, his mercy. Um, but I'm looking in particular a power that is addressed here in the book of Ephesians, that uh, if you're saved this morning, you have experienced. Grace, peace, it's, it's all good and true things, yes. His saving power, yes. What in particular I'm talking about is the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. This mighty power which worketh in us, the book of Ephesians says, and it is the same power that works in you and in me to renew our life, to give us a new life as the same power that brought and gave Jesus Christ new life and brought him back from the dead. Did you know that? That same power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead is, if you're saved this morning, the power of Jesus Christ that works in you to help you accomplish his will in your life. I think that is pretty powerful, <laughs> amen, literally. Uh, I think that, uh, that as we look through our scripture, we find that there is no mightier force in God's universe than that resurrection power. Uh, I mean, just think about it. How in the world could God take a sinful person, a, a person that by default is bent against God, a person that could never ever do any real good in the eyes of God, and then take that sinful person, wash it, cleanse it spiritually, and forgive those sins, and, uh, restore them from the enemy of God into a son or daughter of God, and bring them into your adoption through Jesus Christ, and then more so, not just save them out of this sinful, wicked world, but then keep them in this sinful, wicked world, and create in them a desire and the ability and the power to live a more and more righteous life. That new life that Jesus Christ gives. I think that is more powerful than any force in this universe. And it's that same resurrection power that rose Jesus Christ from the dead that works, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, in you and in me. And so therefore, we can definitely claim that whenever God shows up in our life, whether it is in salvation in particular, but even after that, as we've looked at last week, there is a difference. There is a difference. Amen. I mean, you cannot have an encounter with the greatest force of this universe and just leave the same way you came. And uh, that's where in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4, we read, But God, amen? But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we're dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Christ. By grace are you saved. You know what? What these verses mean? They mean that God has made an impossibility and turned it into reality in your life. The moment you trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ, this death, death, burial, and resurrection to wash away your sin, and you became a child of God. That is powerful, amen, pun intended. And so that is what we're, we're looking at when we're looking at a new life in Jesus Christ. And as we go through the book of Ephesians, Lord willing, verse by verse, if he tarry his coming, if he comes before we're done, hallelujah, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Um, and uh, it, it seems to be more and more likely, if you ask me, we find, though, that God has revealed his will for you and for me. And not just that, he has also given us the enablement, the strength, the power to fulfill that will in our lives. Now notice the difference that Jesus Christ makes in our life. First of all, in my position. In other words, in 
who I am. Let me ask you this, who are you this morning? <laughs> and I'm not just asking for your name, I'm asking who are you as a person? Your identity, spiritually, mental, emotionally, and all of these things. Who are you as a person, your identity? You see, if you're saved this morning, and, and, and I like to believe that you are, um, and since you have the desire to worship the Lord here together, uh, the book of Ephesians tells us in chapter 1 and verse 3, and that's what we're going to look at this morning there in chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, in Christ. And that those two words, in Christ, in Him, will find repeatedly used throughout Ephesians and especially in chapter 1. And we'll look into all of those applications and implications of you, of, of who you are now, that you are in Christ. Did you know that you've gotten a new identity? when you became in Christ. You're not that same person that you used to be anymore as a, 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 a sinner, a rebel against God. I mean, that address is dead. That phone line does not work anymore. I mean, that passport is shredded up and you now have a new identity, so to speak, spiritually speaking. But not just that, it, not just who you are has changed, as we, we call that our position in Christ, but there's also been a difference in my practice. Not just in my position, but it's also in my practice, or in other words, in, um, in what I ought to be doing. What I ought to be doing. And I think those are the two keys. I first need to understand who I am, in Christ, so that I can then understand what or also how, what I ought to be doing by Jesus Christ. In other words, in His strength and His power and might. That's where we see in Ephesians 3 verse 21 and following there, it says, Unto Him be glory in the church. It's God's will for each and every one of us this morning to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen through our life. Unto Him, Jesus, be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Notice there, how ought do we now bring glory to God and live that different life? By Jesus Christ. In other words, first we're changed in our position and who I am by now being in Jesus Christ, and then I'm being changed uh, of what I ought to be doing because of the different person that I now am. And I'm doing that now by Jesus Christ. My position defines my practice, and my practice reflects my position. Let me say this again, and then I'll illustrate that, because I, I understand this is, is, is trying to think a little bit deep here this morning. My position in Christ defines my practice by Christ. And my practice reflects who I am, reflects my position. Let me illustrate this to you this way. This is a pig. Now, a pig, that's who it is, amen, a pig. And so a pig does what a pig does. Why? Because it's a pig. So a pig swallows in the, uh, wallows in the mud. A pig grunts. Don't you like that? This is so cool. It's one of my children's favorite toys. <coughs> <coughs> Anyways. <coughs> a pig eats like crazy. A pig stings. I mean, a pig just does what a pig does, right? Why in the world would a pig do those things? Well, because it's a pig, right? Who it is defines what it's doing. <laughs> and, and, and now, now contrast that <clears throat> with a giraffe. See, why in the world would you contrast a pig with a giraffe? Very simple. Because it was the only other toy my kids had that made noises too. <laughs> 
Oh my, church can be so much fun. A giraffe is a giraffe, right? That's who it is. And so a giraffe with their six foot neck and the six foot uh, legs, which ends up being between 14 and 18 feet height, does what a giraffe does. It's just roaming the African savanna and eating tons and tons of leaves and, and, and so forth because that's just what giraffes do. Why? Because they are a giraffe. And in a similar way, you and I are doing a are living our life accordingly to who we understand we are. To what I know my identity to be. And you see, there is the crux of the matter of so many a Christian, a failed Christian identity, a failed Christian life. There is the key to, to many of a defeat, many of a unnecessary emotional or spiritual or otherwise struggle in my life because I've never been properly taught and never properly understood from the Word of God who I actually am now, that I am saved, that I am a, a reborn, a recreated, a blood-washed believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I cannot act like a giraffe, to use this picture, if I still understand myself to be a pig. Amen? Amen? Or the other way around. And so I, I hope you get that picture there. <laughs> um, just to visualize that a little bit. The ideas for illustrations you get when you're having little kids in your home. I tell you, it's dangerous. <laughs> um, but you know what? That kind of giraffe lifestyle of running around on tall legs and eating leaves is something that kind of lifestyle a pig could never get excited about. <laughs> right? And uh, the, the other way around, of course. Matter of fact, it's something that a pig could never be, uh, would never be able to do. They're, they're way too short-legged and, legged and fat, fat usually. <laughs> and, um, and so the same thing for the giraffe, of course. All the, the junk food, so to speak, that pigs uh, don't mind eating at all, um, a giraffe could not live on that. By the way, interesting thing I found out about giraffes. Now, this one, obviously, this toy one, obviously doesn't. Um, but giraffes, just like uh, our fingerprints, their, their brown markings are very unique and individual to each giraffe. Apparently, just like our fingerprints, there's not a single giraffe that has the exact same markings like another one. And, and the same with, with our fingerprints, right? That's why you've heard, that, heard me make this joke before, that um, you know, God has, each, has made each and every one of us a somebody, <laughs> right? Because your thumbprint does not match up with any other person in this world. Um, and so, um, that's just a little tidbit there about giraffes. But I mean, just think about it in, in, the, in the human world, if we transfer that illustration back here. If, um, if a toddler acts like a toddler, we understand that. That is expectable, right? It, that is to be expected. Uh, I, I mean, we don't find it strange if a toddler cries and runs to the potty or you know, tries to throw their fits and, and all of that stuff, what just toddlers do, uh, whether it be good or bad, because, well, that's just what a toddler does. They do that because they're a toddler. Now, on the other hand, as they mature and hopefully grow up and hopefully get trained properly, you know what, as, uh, as an adult, if an adult acts like a toddler which I'm sure, unfortunately, many of us have seen either in real life or in the news, um, you know what? We find that to be unnatural. That is unnatural. An adult shouldn't act like a toddler. Well, why? Because they're an adult now, <laughs> right? They're an adult now. They ought to uh, be able to, uh, uh, to grow and mature and get trained and, and behave themselves properly and, and, and be decent and mature and responsible and be disciplined. And so if an adult uh, uh, has toddler-like behavior, we find that unnatural. And you see, the same way um, it, it happens with our Christian identity. So many times, I'm still acting like the unsaved person. I'm still living the lifestyle uh, uh, of an unregenerated person. Um, I'm still uh, adjusting to the dictates of the world around me, not because I don't have the power of Christ in me. Not because, you know, well, Christianity just doesn't work. Only the pastor's prayers are being answered, any, any of that. No. But rather because I've never actually understood who I am, first and foremost. 
Because that is the basis that is uh, is uh, what, uh, that my behavior, my lifestyle is built upon. That is what my practice is reflecting back. But before we look any further into the details, and Lord willing, we will do that, of our new identity in Christ here throughout the book of Ephesians. And folks, that'll bless you. That'll encourage you. I mean, this is probably the, one of the most exciting stuff to preach about. And I, and I love this. I'm really looking forward to it. But this morning, though, I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1. And first, though, consider how we even got this new purpose in life. How we even got this new identity in life. And then also how we can live in that new identity. Because we find here the Apostle Paul describing how that happened in his life. It says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. To the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice here, how did he become an apostle? How, how did he get that calling, that vocation to be a messenger of God? By the will of God. By the will of God. Now, I found many, many a Christian, I've even been there in my own life, um, that live in agony, in, in a constant uh, a search in the darkness of God's will. Uh, either in general, the great purpose of my life, or in many particulars. And to be sure, there's no way I could answer each and every detail of God's will for your life this morning. Um, matter of fact, the Bible doesn't necessarily always give us exactly the details of which job to take or which investment to make or not or, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, all of these decisions or, you know, when to do this or that. Not all of these details are, are clearly defined by us as God's will in the Scriptures. But there is a basic framework a foundation that we can then build upon as we walk with God day by day and as he leads us through his word and his Holy Spirit that you and I can work on and that we can define as living by the will of God. It's like a designer, right? Uh, whether it's an architect for a building or whether it's, uh, you know, an interior designer, right? Or a, a fashion designer, whatever it may be that you're designing, you have a blueprint, a plan for it. And you, you know where this is all headed. And that's uh, the same way that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has given to you and to me a design and uh, a plan and a purpose for our life. Um, you know, my cell phone, for example, the designer of it knows the best how it's supposed to work and what each part is for because they've put it there, right? And they know the idea behind it. In the same way, God, as my and your designer, especially of our new life in Christ, knows best how to live our life. But I cannot achieve God's design and purpose for my life by my own willpower, can I? And, or by my own wishes. You see, you have not been called to a new life and a new identity by the will of your parents or the will of your church or the will of this world's society or anyone else. You and I have been called, similar like the Apostle Paul, by the will of God to live a new life. So let me ask you this. Do you know what God's will is for you today? Or what God's will is for your life? or at least this week. See, it would be kind of important to know that, right? Because how else can I then make a checklist, so to speak, spiritually speaking, and make sure that I've accomplished that, right? That I've, uh, that I've lived and breathed out my, my purpose, my design, my calling, so to speak. You see, because not every one of us has these spectacular, dramatic events in our life um, you know, like the Apostle Paul, where he sees this great light on the road to Damascus, and he turns from a persecutor to apostle overnight, basically. And, and, and uh, I mean, he, all of this, these great sensational events. You know, most of all, as, as we see God's will for our day-to-day -day life, we, we're not hit by these lights and all of that, are we? And, um, and so there are, are, though, some much better things that God has given us, I believe. 
and that is principles of the Word of God. We clearly spells it out for us that it is God's will for us. God's design is clearly defined for us in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Amen? And so we're scrapping the old blueprints. They don't up to date anymore. They don't accurate anymore. They don't fit my design or purpose anymore. You know, when I moved here from Europe to Canada, um, I had a lot of electronic devices that had European plugs. And that is basically uh, two round metal things sticking out of the plug. And so if I would take these designs for a metal, uh, for an electric plug and try to stick them into the plug boxes here in Canada, I mean, I would have just wrecked stuff. It wouldn't have worked. Because here we have different designs, right? We have two or often three uh, um, thin, squarish little metal pieces that go in. And so if I try to use the old plans and the old designs of my sinful life, and try to use them now into that new life and new identity and design that God has given to me. I mean, it's, 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 it's bound for disaster, right? And so in the coming weeks, Lord willing, we will continue to seek to understand more how that new identity looks like and, and that how it practically affects, affect your life. But this morning, though, I'd like to just take a few more minutes here to focus more upon that new purpose and how we have gotten that new purpose, and that is by the will of God. You see, one thing that we hear continually emphasized, especially as Christians, um, whether it be before we're saved or even after we're saved, that, oh, God has a wonderful plan for your life. God has a wonderful plan for your life, right? I'm sure you heard that before. Why does nobody ever ask to stop? Well, okay, so how does exactly does it look like? What are the points of this, this plan he has? <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Somehow, we're, everybody just gets us all excited about it, and then they leave us to ourselves to try to figure this out. And that's not really fair, is it? And you know what? God has given us very clear, clear points that we can lead along to, to continue to follow God's will for our life. And let me just stop you for one second and encourage all of us this morning. You and I can fulfill God's will for our life. We have examples and stories of that. I could, could, could tell you story after story uh, out of recent days and lives, but I, I think the best illustrations are still always found in the Scripture. In the book of Acts, uh, it is talking there in retro perspective uh, about the King David. And it says there about him that he was a man after mine, after God's own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. That's what God felt about David. And the wonderful news is that David was always a perfect person that never made any mistake, and therefore God at the end of his life felt like he totally, he, he totally hit all the nails, right? <laughs> no, of course he didn't. Of course he didn't. David was a mess, like you and me. <laughs> Sometimes maybe worse even. I mean, murder, adultery, a dysfunctional family, if you've ever seen one. I mean, just unbelievable. And yet, though, God says, looking back on his life, in Acts 13, verse 36, for David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God. If a mess like David can fully fulfill all of God's will for his life, I believe God's will and God's power can accomplish the same thing in you and in me. Matter of fact, we have way more scripture than David did. We have the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit to guide and enable us. I mean, we have so much more than he did. So how could God say that he fulfilled all of his will for his life when, when he messed up so many times? And I think that is where we really need to look at exactly what God's will is, but more so at uh, the fact that, that the, the power 
of repentance is unbelievable. You see, when, when you're driving a vehicle, you're constantly correcting your course, right? I mean, you can, you can uh, set your speed and lock it in, but you can't set your steering wheel and lock it in, all right? If you do get a different car, because <laughs> um, you're, you're about to, to go straight on the curve and then it will end in a disaster. Um, and you know, there's a good reason for that, that we can't lock in our steering wheel. Because it's not just lock and set, it's constantly adjusting, right? And you see, God gives us the opportunity for that as well. Even or especially when we deviate from his course and where we're messing up his will for our life. God says, oh, I'm just anxiously waiting for you to come right back. I'm just, just, just seeking a person that has a humble heart and a desire like David in Psalm 51 to say, God, I'm guilty. God, I've sinned against you. Help me, God. I want to go back to where you want me to be. And you know what? Yes, there were consequences. Yes, there were pains and troubles. But you know what? That did not alter God's will for his life. And that it did not alter the opportunity David had each and every day getting up in the morning and continuing to fulfill successfully that will of God for his life. So real quick, like this morning, I'd like to compare God's will and, and the difference that but God makes in that sense um, with maybe, you know, jumping on, on a bus, right? And, and maybe you've taken the public transit here in Victoria and you've, you've, you've gone on that bus uh, transit. And so now I want you to imagine that instead of the route and the bus that you've always taken, you're going to Take on, uh, take on a completely new bus. I mean, it's a different color, it's a different driver, it's a completely new vehicle, you know, it's, it's all CO2, zero emissions and all of that. And, and, and I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about a completely new bus, a completely new vehicle that you're going to enter now. Once that but God difference comes into your life, amen, you get saved. And so just, just for the sake of picture, of illustration, and how does this new vehicle look like? Well, of course, that is... What I'd like to compare with your salvation, your salvation. How can I know that that is God's will for my life? Well, because 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says that, um, that the, the Lord is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. Do you know that God doesn't want you to perish? Amen. God wants you to be saved. Because God is a God of love and of never-ending mercy. God is long-suffering to us, we're not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. So you can always know assuredly that it's God's will for you to get saved. <laughs> Amen. You can also um, uh, uh, see that um, in uh, John chapter 10, verse 28, where the Lord says, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I mean, we're talking about a complete overhaul here. I mean, this new vehicle, this new bus you're going to enter on does not look anything like the old junk uh, uh, clunker that you were driving around for most of your life, maybe. It's a new and eternal life. Acts chapter 17, the Lord says that God now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, where if he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead, and I'll watch Jesus Christ. Amen. And so God's conditions for entering that new bus to get that, uh, that ticket is really very simple. John chapter 3 verse 36 spells it out clear and for everyone to see in black and white. John 3, verse 36 says this. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Now notice, we've already clarified that God does not want his wrath to abide on you. He wants you to get to be delivered. That's what salvation means. To get out from under that judgment. Amen. And rather into the adoption as a child of God in Jesus Christ. But there's a condition. You have to believe on the Son. And you will have eternal life. So that's where John chapter 3 verse 15 goes on to say that whosoever believeth 
in him and Jesus should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved you, amen, loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him, notice, open to anyone. Open to those that have never heard a single Bible verse in all of their life. Open to those who are very young, as soon as they can understand the gospel, and open to those who have lived a hundred or more years. Open to whosoever. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's his desire, his will for you and for me. Amen. And really for everyone. For all, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Amen. And so the Lord has promised that in John chapter 6 verse 37 that him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. So if you come to God on his term and you admit that you're a sinner and you ask for forgiveness of your sins in Jesus Christ, your disobedience against God and his holy laws, and you admit that there's no hope nor or no help for your eternal soul outside of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection, that he is accomplished in perfect righteousness in your stead, in my stead, amen? You cannot enter that new bus. You cannot enter that new bus. But if you do, and if you, as Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, that if you trusted in him, in Jesus, in whom you also trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, after all that ye, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Let me tell you this, you're on that bus that is called salvation in Jesus Christ, and nobody can ever get you out of there. Amen? And so, then, you're not just having a new bus, a new vehicle, uh, so to speak, a salvation, a new life. You also, secondly, in God's will, and by the will of God, you have a new destination. I mean, you're not going the same places that you used to go anymore. This bus is going to bring you different places. Why? Because, but God, amen, always makes a difference. But God always makes a difference. So we have a new vehicle, but we also have a new destination. But God, who's rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we're dead in sins, hath quickened us. That means made alive, has quickened us together in, with Christ. By grace are you saved. And hath raised us up together. Now, notice this, Ephesians 2, verse 6. Ephesians 2, verse 6. And made us... Are you saved this morning? That, then this includes you. It made us, made you, sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Did you know that positionally you are already sitting in heaven right next to the Lord Jesus Christ? Now, practically speaking, you and I are still living in the nasty here and now, amen? And, and with all the struggles of sin and weakness and so forth and trials and difficulties. But let me tell you about that new destination. I mean, there are no bus stops on that way until we get to those pearly gates. And until we will, not just positionally, but also physically, sit together with the Lord Jesus Christ and rule and reign forevermore. And, and that's where, where I want to uh, turn to Revelation chapter 21. And I want you to really get excited about the road you're on. Amen? Because we're going a different way than the way of all this world. Amen? They're, they're, they're driving in a different destination. They're in a different bus on a different lane. But you and I are already in the right direction. And it all ends and accumulates there in Revelation chapter 21 in verse 3. In Revelation 21 verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. Amen. This is all just temporary. Now notice verse 5. 
And he that sat upon the throne, the Lord Jesus Christ, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I'm the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Oh boy, in this world we have tribulation, the Lord Jesus Christ told us. Oh, in this world it seems it may get getting worse and worse as we see the day approaching. Oh, this world is making us perplexed. This world seems complicated, and this life definitely is painful at times. But boy, howdy. Don't despair, dear Christian friend. Don't get discouraged. Oh, don't, 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 you, don't you think about jumping off of that bus because you're headed in the right direction. You're headed towards those pearly gates. You're headed to that heavenly Jerusalem. And oh, that Jerusalem. Oh, that city of God where his glory will dwell forever. And for all of eternity, you and I will sing hallelujah, hallelujah, Oh, glory, honor, and praise to the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. I don't know about you, but we got a reason to be excited, I think. Amen. And if you're on the bus, the but God bus, the in Jesus Christ bus, you're headed in the right direction, no matter what happens with the rest of this present evil world. I think that is encouraging, folks. I really do believe so. And so we not just have a new destination, thirdly and lastly this morning, we also have a new direction. Or really, we have a new route, a new way where we're heading. Amen? We have a new vehicle, we have a new destination, and we have a new direction that your bus is now headed, so to speak. Ephesians 2 verse 10 says, Where his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. God's plan and purpose is designed for your life. The will of God for you was already all thought out before he ever said, let there be light. We've talked about that on Thursday. That's pretty awesome. Because you know what that means? It means there's no surprises in, for God in your life. He's already got it all figured out. And the Lord Jesus Christ said that whosoever shall do the will of God the same as my brother and my sister. And I'd like to encourage you this morning. Let's not just positionally, but also practically, as we head into this new direction, this new route, a route, um, let's fulfill all the will of God for our life. Oh, wow, and the time is flying away on us. Um, I just quickly want to take a few minutes, if you just bear with me, to just describe that new direction a little bit more practically. We start off in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 3, where we see how God wants us to not just have a different bus, so to speak, a new identity in Jesus Christ and salvation, not just a new end destination in that heavenly city, the new Jerusalem, but also he wants us to be right now different on a different route a different street and he wants us to be in that sense different than the sin loving world around us different than the sin loving world around us galatians 1 verse 3 says grace be to you and peace from god the father and from our lord jesus christ notice this in verse 4 who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of god and our Father. Notice, it is God's will for you and for me to be delivered from this present evil world, not to be part and parcel of it, not to join in it and to be partakers in it. Romans chapter 12, 12 verse 2 says that we ought to not be conformed to this world, this world that we're living in right now. We ought to be not conformed to this world, but be you transform by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That word prove means to test. In other words, we, we, we experience that in real. We, 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 we can bank and build upon that each and every day. 
See, there's a good reason why 1 Peter chapter 2 calls us pilgrims and strangers on this earth. And sometimes I think the greatest hindrance for you and for me to fulfill our new identity in Jesus Christ and God's will for our life is that we're way too attached to this life. I mean, we've long become permanent residents or maybe living like acting citizens instead of just strangers, just pass us through, pilgrims on our way to the next destination, which is the way God really desires for us to live. Sometimes we might take this world way too serious. We might take this life as way too significant, whereas this is really just the preparation stage. It's just to travel through to what really matters and actually counts. And that is uh, uh, the next life that we're preparing right now and right here with our decisions today. Some very practical things that the Bible spells out for us are, that are the will of God. And I, uh, I just encourage you to write down these references in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, in verse 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification that you should abstain from fornication and a whole list of other sins there. In other words, it is God's will for you and for me to be dedicated to fully serving and obeying Jesus Christ instead of being the slave to sin. That's God's will for me. Now notice, I've been enabled to do that by the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. And if or when we do mess up on that, Oh, we can always return right back to, and the quicker the better, with a humble heart and trust God's promises that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If He could do it for a wicked David, He can do it for you and for me. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. You know what? A grateful spirit is God's will for our life. That's tough sometimes, isn't it? Especially in trials and, and just perplexing situations and just the difficult day-to-day -day grind of life that is wearing us down. You know why it's so difficult? Because a grateful spirit toward God requires humility towards God. I was recognizing that I do not deserve all of God's blessings. And so that's why I'm very thankful for them. That's why I'm very thankful for them. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. God does not want us to just be humble towards him, though he also requires humility towards other people in us. He wants us to serve others with that kind of a heart. For so is the will of God, 1 Peter 2, verse 15 says, 1 Peter 2 15, for so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. You know what? There are many things that I'm allowed to do by God, that I'm free to do as a Christian. But maybe in one way or another, there could be a hindrance, a stumbling block to another Christian or another person. Maybe they could um, keep back somebody else from being saved. Maybe they could hinder somebody else from doing the right thing. And so I have the liberty to do that, yes. But because I don't want to just be humble towards God, when I'm humble towards God, I also have a desire towards, to be humble towards people. And so I want to serve them by well-doing. Amen. Whether saved or unsaved, whether nice or unfriendly. And lastly... Something else that we find very clearly to be the will of God as well is the willingness to endure suffering joyfully. The willingness to endure suffering joyfully. And I just want to read there in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 17. 1 Peter 3, verse 17. For it is better if the will of God be so. In other words, at times it is. If the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil doing. So it's contrasting that. Amen. 1 Peter 4 verse 2 says that he, that he shall no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh 
to the lust of man, but to the will of God. Verse 19, Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him, to God, and well-doing us unto a faithful creator. In other words, you and I can be motivated by the example of Jesus Christ who suffered wrongfully, who suffered unjustly, who was discriminated, who was treated unfairly, who could have become bitter and offended, could have gotten mad or angry or even even. He had legions of angels to do so. And yet he chose not to. It was his choice. It's a choice. Rather, he was looking upon the joy that was set before him while he was enduring that suffering. That's what he focused upon, amen? And so he rather, while he was suffering, committed th those issues to him that judges righteously, the Bible teaches us, to the Father in heaven, amen? See, that's the trial of your faith that is much more precious than gold that perishes. Though it would be tried with fire, and you know, sometimes it does get hot, doesn't it? Might be though found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, ye love, in whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, notice, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Folks, that is living out God's will by faith. And that's just what I want to encourage us with this morning. As we go through this week, as we go through these next weeks and months and years, let's really learn and study out from the Word of God who I really am. Because only then I can truly understand how and what kind of a life God practically then wants me to live. And the first thing that I need, that I need to understand is that I need to stop living my life by my will. Just like the Apostle Paul was a, the Apostle Paul by the will of God, you and I need to now live our new identity as saved people in Christ by the will of God. And so that involves jumping on that new bus, amen? And so I trust you've done that. You are saved. But more so then, it also involves focusing upon and looking forward to that new end destination that you and I are headed towards and keeping that in mind. And not getting distracted off of that. But while we travel there, let's remember that we are traveling in a different direction than the rest of this world. And that there's these, these, these uh, uh, anchoring points, so to speak, of God's will that the Lord has given to us. Where he clearly and literally spells out to us, this is the will of God for you. And so just like David could, you and I can live through the power and strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. And get up each day. And say, Lord, please help me to live your will today. How about this week, we just all stop after we get up and pray and say, God, what's your plan for today? Lord, what, what is your will for me today? Amen. What is your will for me today, Lord? One simple, practically easy step all of us can do. A oh, boy, I believe it will change the direction that we're traveling while we are still in this life headed towards the heavenly destination in a powerful way. So let's be encouraged this morning. The destination is locked in. The GPS is set. And so let's not lose sight of that. And let's move forward, amen? Even so much the more as we see the day approaching. So I'd like to just encourage you to stand this morning and